My next guest is an author and filmmaker who overcame life on the streets of Boston, including addiction to drugs and alcohol and numerous stints in prison. It was while serving a nine-year sentence for armed robbery that he began a long road to recovery. That story is at the heart of a new memoir, The Big Hustle, a Boston street kid's story of addiction and redemption. Please welcome Jim Wahlberg to the program. Jim, you got into drinking and drugs at a very young age. How did this start and why? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm the middle child of nine kids. We grew up, mm. my parents were mostly working two jobs at a time each. So I think I was really starved for attention. And um, I think I started looking for that attention in all the wrong places. Hmm. Now, you end up in prison for armed robbery, as we mentioned a second ago. And right. uh, six months after your release, you're back in state prison for burglarizing a police officer's home. You write that it was state right. prison and God that saved you. You thought you were going to hustle the Catholic prison chaplain that you met there, but instead he hustled you. What happened? Right. Well, I mean, he approached me about uh, a job opportunity, uh, cleaning the chapel. And, uh, mm. of course, I thought immediately, he's a priest that smokes, which was an unusual thing. Um, he smokes cigarettes. I'm going to get cigarettes. I'll have access to a phone. I'll a have a quiet place. I was really, mm. I just really only thought about what I was going to get out of this, this relationship, mm -hmm. this friendship. And uh, it wasn't long after I started the job where he started to say to me, listen, I think it would be good if you, if you clean the chapel on Saturday night. So why don't you come to Mass first? And then you can just stay and clean. And I didn't even catch on, right? I didn't, I just thought, I'm, that's my job, I'm going to clean, and I'll go sit through the Mass. And, uh, and ultimately, that was part of the plan the whole time, was to get me back to Mass, to get me back to the faith. Hmm. In 1988, Mother Teresa visited the prison where you were serving. Mm. Uh, what was that day like, and how did that visit change your life? How old were you then, just for the audience's sake? Uh, 1988, I was 23 years old. Father Freitas came to me after just working in a couple of, couple, there in a couple of weeks, and he said to me, um, we have a very special guest coming to the prison. And I said, really, Father, who's that? And he said, Mother Teresa is coming to this prison. And uh, I said to him, that's awesome. Who's Mother Teresa? Because I had no <laughs> idea. My life consisted of my next drink or my next drug. I really had no idea of any kind of sort of celebrity or famous people or even a saintly person. Mm -hmm. And when she showed up, what happened? Well, I, I remember the day like it was yesterday, to be honest with you, Raymond. Uh, she came walking into, it was a quad setup. There's 40 foot walls with razor wire on top. And the, the center of the place was a quad setup. And I see this large group of people coming towards me or walking in the direction that I was in, and many of them were in suits, and I could start to recognize them as like the governor and the warden and a bunch of really important people. And in the middle, I see this little figure, this little teeny five-foot-tall woman. And I, as she got closer to me, I noticed that her slippers looked like they were 100 years old. Her sweater looked like it was 200 years old. And I looked a little closer, and her pockets were full of money, which I hadn't seen money in a couple of years. Right? Because we don't have cash in prison. And, um, and so as she came forward, I was clearly aware that I was in the presence of somebody very special. Now, I was blessed to be part of the procession for the mass that was done in her, her honor. And um, I remember processing in and her being beckoned by the, by the cardinal to come up to the stage or the altar, and there was a special seat for her. And she refused. She refused to go into that seat. She refused to go onto the altar. Instead, she stayed on her knees with the sisters from her, or, from her order. And it was at that mm -hmm. point when I looked into her face, and I, I, mean, I thought I was looking in the face of God, to be quite honest with mm. you. I was so moved. And it is the absolute most defining moment in my life. It's the, it's the moment that everything changed for me. And what that means for me is, is that it caused me to go back to Father Freitas and say, I want to know more. I want to know more about my faith. I want to know more about mm -hmm. God. She got up and spoke at that, at that mass. And she said things that changed 
everything for me. For the first time in my life, I heard the words, you're more than what you're convicted of. You're more, of your, more than your prison number. You're more than the crimes that you committed. You're a child of God, and God loves you and wants the best for you. I didn't grow up with that. I didn't grow up with that God. I grew up with the God is going to get you. And, um, mm -hmm. and that's a terrible way to grow up, to be quite honest with you, right? Because mm -hmm. I'm afraid. And if God knows everything and I'm doing bad all the time, I'm in a lot of trouble. You know, so mm -hmm. I could never turn to him in a more loving way. Right. Well, you write in the book uh, of your childhood, you said, look, I, I had no concept or understanding of a loving God. I didn't realize that God mm -hmm. loves us all, even sinners, and that Jesus mm. Christ died for my sins. Just because I make a mistake doesn't mean that God isn't going to love me and forgive me. Mm. I just didn't have a clue. How has your relationship with God strengthened over time, and how has your faith helped keep you sober and helped your sobriety? All right. So I, I can tell you this, that that event led me to making my confirmation. That event mm. brought me back to the faith. Then I was released from prison, and I was released in the middle of the biggest scandal in the church in Boston. It was happening. Mm. And, yeah. and I was, it was really easy for me to sort of walk away from the faith, but sort of I left with my own conception of God, right? And I'm mm. not qualified to create a conception of God. I can tell you that right now. And so I drifted away from the faith, and, and I struggled a lot. I, I did stay clean, I did stay sober, but I wasn't happy and I wasn't fulfilled. There was an emptiness inside of me. And, uh, and I, what I did was, is I worked on the outside, but I didn't work on the inside. So I looked like I was successful, I looked like I was doing good, I was married, I was having children, things were going, I owned a home, um, but I was unhappy inside, and so, it was after years of sort of being unhappy that uh, I was, again, nudged by my wife and my 12-year-old and my daughter at the time um, to take some steps back towards the faith, in which I did. Mm -hmm. I went on a, I went on, on a men's retreat and, uh, and really got, got knocked to my knees in, in, in such a profound way um, that uh, the last 12 years of my, of my walk with Christ have been and it, 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 my life is, is completely different, you know? And it didn't, doesn't mean that everything got easy, but I did become keenly aware of the fact that when I, you know, I've had events in my life that have made me feel the presence of God, but those, to keep that feeling for me, I gotta do work. I have to work on that relationship mm -hmm. with Christ. I have to do work to be closer to Him. I can't just coast on yesterday's sort of white light experience. And so um, I, have, I have been, uh, I was beaten into a state of reasonableness and I, was, and I became willing to do that work and to have that relationship and to feel his presence. You, you experienced great pain, I know, later as a father when you discovered that your own son was addicted. And mm. uh, you write movingly about that discovery. How did you help him? And I understand EWTN played a small role and uh, the Comunita Chinocolo, which was a favorite of our former yeah. Bishop of Birmingham, uh, Bishop Robert Baker. Sure. Tell me about that moment. Yeah. So let's be clear. EWTN didn't, pay, didn't play a small role. They played a pivotal role in the process. Mm. And, you know, in the, in the front of my book, um, I dedicated the book to, to the women in my journey, and, and really Mother Angelica should have been in that. Um, you know, my, I was dealing with my son's addiction problems sort of the way I learned how to deal with my own, and I tried to take him to self-help groups and, do, and you know, put him into treatment programs and do all this stuff, and it wasn't working because he just wasn't, he wasn't, he didn't want it, and he wasn't prepared to do right. anything. And, my wife was watching EWTN, and it was the very first time, it was Life on the Rock, I believe, and the guys from Communita Chinacola were on there, and they were giving their testimonies. And my, mm -hmm. while my wife was watching EWTN, listening to these guys give their testimonies, I was in a car driving from Florida to Rhode Island with my son sitting next to me to take him to a treatment center. And mm -hmm. um, my wife called me, and she said, I found the place that my son needs to go. My son needs God. Wow. That's what my son needs, right? And, uh, and it was 
a, a while after that before we actually got to the place where we left my son no other choice, right? Was we tried everything there was, nothing was working, and we said, okay, we want to, we'll support you, but this is what we think you should do, and if you want to do that, we're here for you. If not, then you're going to have to figure it out on your own because we can't mm. do this anymore. We're part of the problem now, and uh, and we went and we met with the community, and uh, and I'll tell you, it's been ten years that we've been connected. To community and uh, and and it's been a uh, it's been an unbelievable beautiful journey. Wow, 8.7 million children, Jim, in the U.S. have a parent who suffers from substance uh, abuse or a, a substance use disorder. You've recently right. directed a new short film uh, called "What About the Kids," and it explores what happens when op opioid addiction affects children and the role faith plays in recovery mm. and healing. Now, this isn't the first film right. you've directed about addiction. Where can people see your films, and what do you want them to take from that as well as the books? Okay, so this particular film can be seen at whataboutthekidsfilm.com. And mm -hmm. um, this film is, is really my first truly faith-based film. It is, um, it's, I, I've done 10 films on addiction, but right. as my faith increased, I knew that I needed to start, because I look at everything from, from a faithful perspective, I need to mm -hmm. tell those stories. See, the thing mm -hmm. is, is that this addiction, this addiction epidemic, this opioid epidemic that we're living through right now, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people in the last 15 years have died yeah. from opioids. And, mm. you know, they were parents, they were siblings, they were people's children, they were people's coworkers, friends, and they're gone. And so they leave behind them not only do they leave uh, a trail of broken hearts, but they also leave people dealing with stigma, right? People mm -hmm. are uh, treated a different way when a, people don't understand addiction or substance use disorder. They don't understand that it's a, a real illness. Um, they think it's a choice, and they think, you know, that's what you get. And it's terrible. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I often tell the, the story uh, of a parent who calls their neighbor and says to them, my child has cancer. When you do that, your neighbors make you a casserole. They cut your lawn. Mm. They go grocery shopping for you. They embrace you. You right. tell your neighbor, my son is a drug addict. They lock the doors, pull the shades down, and they avoid you, right? Mm. And we need, to, we need to address that. We need to address that in a major way. And I want to say that in this particular film, we have the Archbishop of Miami, Thomas Wensky, in the film. And he delivers lines in, he does the funeral in this film, and he delivers lines, we need to do more as a faith community for our sick. And we need to do more to lift these people up. And, uh, and I agree with those lines completely. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I do as well. Now, you are executive director of the Mark Wahlberg Youth Foundation, where you work with your brother to help inner city right. kids. How does this connect? to your personal story, to your sobriety and your recovery. Do you see reflections of your younger self on the street with the kids you deal with? I do. And you know, it's, it's uh, when I look at some of these young kids, so we do events. I'm on, on tour with the DEA showing a different film that we made. We do events with mm -hmm. between 5,000 and 10,000 kids. And the movie is about a young person's sort of journey with experimenting with opioids. And it's a very mm -hmm. powerful and, and it's a very sad uh, piece of work. And I look at these kids that are like seventh graders, they're 12 years old. When I was 12 years old, I was homeless. And I look at them and I, and I, and I think about, you know, only God could could get me out of that situation. Only God could take all of the ugliness about my life and turn it into an asset for me to be able to reach these young people in a way that they know it's not, I'm just not another old guy learned, that learned something out of a book, that I lived this and I lived it when I was their age. Um, it, it's been impactful in, in to be around them and to see them and to see them grow and to see them making commitments that they want to live a different way and they don't want to be another victim of this thing um, is it's moving. It's it's powerful. 
Well, uh, your, your book is also moving and powerful. I hope uh, many people get it. It's certainly needed today. The Big Hustle, a Boston street kid story of addiction and redemption by Jim Wahlberg is available at bookstores everywhere from our Sunday Visitor Press. And incidentally, the foreword is by our next guest. Jim, thank you for being here. Thank you, Raymond. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you.